Hello, my name is Adam Bean and welcome to the 53rd edition of Airhex TV. So let's start with the topics. So some uh, minor updates is the following. So in the uh, performance troubleshooting and monitoring workshop in December, I will also cover some uh, logging, uh, analyze, uh, analyzing log files and tooling around that. So I uh, found some interesting uh, stuff. So I will talk about this as well. And we have uh, the, uh, the, the registrations are coming in. So it looks really good. So all workshops will take place. So now something very new, and this is Airhex carriers. So um, what this is, um, I get uh, questions by airhex.com alumni, alumnus, and they ask me, you know, uh, do I know uh, some Java E interesting Java E projects? And uh, what I also get question is from companies, my clients, whether I know uh, Java E developers. And the first thing is um, what I what I actually did. I uh, I gathered this request and I created a site. And the site contains developers which um, who attended the uh, airhex.com workshops, and uh, like Java E are motivated and would like to have some projects. And yeah, I started with four, and the Java Duke is also there. So it was not really didn't really attended the workshops, but it is omnipresent. So um, I just. Uh, also took the, the Duke. So if you attended ax.com in Munich and I know you and you would like to be listed here, just ping me and I will send you a small JSON file and it will be included in generated. This page is uh, generated by the SPG, which stands for uh, Static Page Generator and is written with Java 8, of course, and NAS1. So this is a very, very new, I would say, three days. So the next news is the new... Um, podcast about with uh, Mike Milinkovic about uh, Jakarta EE and EE4J relation between EE4J and Jakarta EE um, how it started so um, how the open source initiatives started how to become a committer how to hack the Jakarta EE process how to contribute and uh, how is decided what comes into the next pack so I ask the questions in about, I think it's about 50 minute podcasts about Jakarta E, Java E, and future of Java E. And I was really surprised how pragmatic Mike really is. So if you're interested in Java E, take a, take a look, not a take a look, uh, listen to the podcast. And um, it was published today, so it's very fresh. Okay, we have that. And now I think we covered everything. Uh, this was the news, and of course, the, in one point of time, there will be um, there will be a counterpart of EHEX carriers, another page for companies. But uh, um, if I get some time, I will do that. So uh, let's start with the very first question. So uh, I I I started w gathering uh, the first ten questions from the gists, and then I got some questions from from my blog, from my comments. I will cover these questions as well. Okay. So um, this is the origin question. So let's switch to here. And uh, she or he, Ali uh, TTB, says, Hello, Adam. Uh, thank you for the great content. I learned about BC, which stands for Boundary Control Entity, from your videos and talks. And thanks to you, I used that in three projects with success. So I'm w really curious about that because um, this is not always the case. <laughs> Oh, funny story. Um, I uh, I suggested BCE for a, uh, a project, and it was um, implemented by external consulting company. And the external consultants told me it is a really hard to use BCE because they have to think about naming and they have to think about structure, and uh, it is really bad for for the juniors back then. They just had a view, you know, view folders like service DTOs and DAOs, and they could, you know, place everything to the folders without any thinking. And um, I have to say, I'm all for thinking. So <laughs> for me, it is better to uh, refactor the folders or packages over and over again, and at the end of the time, ending up having, you know, a simple and nice structure than have your bureaucratic design without any thinking. But um, so if, I'm, I'm really curious about your experiences, bad or good, really. Um, so Alip TDB, if you like, I would like to interview about your experiences with BCE. And by the way, uh, regarding the experiences with BCE, I also interviewed uh, 
a startup, yeah, almost startup, a small project. It was Victor, also an uh, alumni from uh, airhacks.com. He implemented a taxi uh, application, of course, with Java 7 and explains um, his experiences with that. Okay, so we have that. Now, now I'm facing a situation for the first time. So situation means uh, I, that's the first question. And there's two Java 7 microservices. They communicate via JAXRS. And the question is how to organize the code. So first, just regarding that, what how I do this, I have a control which encapsulates the, uh, um, uh, the communication. So what it means is a method with the name init client, for instance, is annotated with post construct. And this method... Um, uh, in, instantiates the JAXRS client and the methods, the business methods, just you know, uh, uh, fetch or, or store something in a remote service. Of course, with uh, with all the patterns we know about, so timeouts and bulkheads and so forth. But now it becomes more interesting. The entity package of each business component has common classes, um, and uh, so what it means is, and uh, now he has, uh, she or he has two wars and the wars uh, are split. So now the question what happens with entity. And uh, um, the developer is using XML root element, which is, means is a Jax B annotation. And uh, what I assume from the question, he would like, uh, sure, he would like to have uh, the entities transferred back and forth between the wars. And the question is how to do that. So if you are thinking about microservices, then I would um, never share entities because if you share entities, there will be one jar which is uh, versioned in a common place, uh, place. Each change to the jar will cause redeployment of two wars. So the question is, why you have two wars in the first place? Do you have two teams? If you have two teams, sharing entities is a really bad idea. So what I will just do, I will copy the entities. So in very, very rare cases, if you can say, okay, these entities, you know, are out of scope of the project. It could be, for instance, some insurance companies have um, a business uh, domain objects which don't really belong to the company, rather are version, uh, versioned externally. And in this particular case, you could, um, you could, uh, you could say, okay, uh, the entities are packaged in a jar ex external to the application, and they could even ship, you know, on with the application server. But this is absolute exception from the rule. Usually, you should copy the entities and uh, and justify copy and paste with bounded context pattern. So uh, your homework is to look up bounded context. Okay, now, Rainy Stroy, ask me. We are building a small to medium web apps as monolith, which is good. Our front-end framework is Apache Wicket, which is also good. Uh, so actually, I used Wicket before JSF2. With JSF2, it was too similar to JSF2, so I switched to JSF2. Uh, it's a really nice framework uh, by uh, written by Dutch guys. And I remember in the, the very first book, they have a cheese store or something like this. So um, yeah, really nice framework. Um, and um, how it works is in, in Wicket, you have a a uh, object hierarchy in Java, and uh, the uh, HTML hierarchy has to correspond with the object hierarchy. So redeploy cycle, this is Maven clean build redeploy on white flag takes 40 to 80 seconds, which is a long time. Um, and it really depends on the dev machine, of course, and SSD. And, and so the question is how much we gain if we would move to a REST backend and just a fronted in terms of time. So um, it really depends because what I observe is what really takes a long time is um, for instance, compilation of uh, named native queries and named queries, because what the database does, it cr creates prepared statements. And this will still take a long time. Usually deploying a front-end framework does not uh, take a lot, does do not take a, lot, a long time. I'm not really sure whether Wicket just pre-compiles something. Uh, so this would will have to check out whether your version of Wicket, something happens with the front-end, like pre-compilation step. If not, I'd, I do not expect any any uh, any any improvement actually. So and what I do with JS frontend, I don't have usually what I use in JS frontends is this ex exactly the same what I use in backend. I just rely on web standards. So I don't use any usually uh, no uh, no npm nothing. I just have JS. So um, the frontend loads in, in one second and the backend in view seconds. So I actually never had uh, problems with uh, redeployment times. But uh, if you watch this series, you probably know I try to delete as much code independencies as possible. 
um, I was looking at some Angular movies, I guess, screencasts, and 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 um, and see web development server being used, and the changes made in the JS frontend are visible instant uh, immediately. Um, the uh, I'm not so sure about Angular; it could even take a, a while in Angular. But usually, it does. The problem with Angular is your development build is different to the to the production build. So if you see what you see in development, um, is something different what will happen later. So it's a little bit dangerous to rely on it um so would we really like to reduce to one minute redeploy cycle to see a change um so if you do for instance what what i usually do i split the back end uh, and, and the front end in, into into two different modules and then uh what what you will get is uh your the front end will you know deploy in i would say one second, half second, view seconds, and the backend would be also fast or faster. And um, what also usually happens in such projects is that the front end changes more frequently than the back end, so will gain something. So usually I have always two modules because the front end changes more regularly than the back end uh, if the project becomes more mature. Okay, now Philip, and I know Philip because Philip attended the uh, ehex.com and also is a part of the ehex carriers so what's your favorite approach to for generating pdf documents so i don't have a favorite approach because i don't like to generate pdf and um, i would say uh, one classic way to generate pdf documents which uh, is uh, apache fop fop formatting objects unfortunately is based on xml and xsl but it's not that as bad and i do, and, and i use that a lot to generate pdf what I used recently, which is not a uh, Java E way, but it worked beautifully, is I used um, Chrome Puppet here. And Chrome Puppet here is the, uh, I, was, I would say, remote controlled version of Chrome, which is perfectly usable to generate PDF. So if you search Chrome Puppet here, um, you will even find, I think, an example of PDF here. So it looks like this. So you will have to wrap the uh, the Chrome Puppet here with, uh, let's say, a, a Node script, uh, uh, a Graal VM, or whatever, and uh, then expose it as a REST service, and then you have uh, a PDF service. So we actually did something before, like this before Google, uh, Chrome Puppet here. I actually forgot forgot the tool, but we use Google Chrome to generate PDF, and how it works is um, very simple. You need a HTML page, which you can use as template. You can use, for instance, master's template and generate PDF, and the quality is the same quality what uh, Chrome does. There's also a PDF library for Firefox, but so far we use Chrome. So this is what we used recently. Um, exactly. So um, HTML templates are perfect. Now, how the next question is, how would you implement rate limiting if you are a vendor of an API? So rate limiting means uh, I only allowed uh, five because Philip is uh, a known hacker. Philip is only allowed, you know, to have five transactions per second. The question is how to implement that. So um, use a servlet filter or custom interceptor. I would use the uh, how it's called, called uh, container request filter, I think, for JAXRS. And what you usually get, you get an API key, which is usually a JSON web token, which is uh, unique. So um, you can even decode the JSON web token and use the username as a token or the entire JSON web token. It really uh, depends how stable it is. It is usually stable, but you can use the uh, JSON web tokens uh, as identifier. Then what you can do, um, I think, uh, if this is a vendor API, what it means you have multiple such services involved. So you can even have a one central microservice, which uh, which uh, gets pinged with a with a uh, json web token and it just uh, uh, sends back you know for 200 or let's say what is bad request 400 so 200 is okay and 400 is overloaded and so you can nicely uh, you know uh, you can nicely implement the logic in a central place um, this is what you could do and uh, philip will attend airhex workshops in december so i'm really curious whether it worked well or not so thank you philip and see you in december and by the way december at munich airport we have a really nice uh, uh, winter market with uh, glowing wine and uh, yeah, it's nice. So, see you in December. Now, Saidra Suli asked me, I want to start that project like Storio, Decentralized Cloud Storage Network. 
So I researched for programming language for this type of project and I understood that Golang is used for st in Storio, IPFS and CIO. Would I ask, yeah, and he would like to ask me several questions, so go for it. Why with using using Java or Scala is not good? And um, I mean, first, Java is very good. I wouldn't use um, personally Scala because I, I think Java is good enough. The question is, is not good. The, the question is, or uh, the problem is Java is boring. So um, everything is already solved and, and, and there's just nothing more exciting left for developers and developers like challenges. So they constantly search for new languages. But if you would like to have something, get something done, I think Java is unbeatable. If you look at the ecosystem, if you look at the IDEs, Java is just stellar. But it's going to be boring. You will have to focus on your story from day one. This is the problem with Java. Uh, before I ask question of Storio programmer, and he said Java is one of the worst languages for powerful and stable software. The resource handling is less than optimal, and especially the overhead slows things down drastically. Okay, let's see. Uh, Elasticsearch, in which language is implemented in Java? And Elasticsearch is uh, the database is extremely fast, and uh, it is even used to store log files of and, uh, lots of companies. Um, if this would be true, Elasticsearch would, would really have, you know, a bad reputation that is slow, does not scale, but I never heard such a thing. The next thing is DerbyDB, a small database, which is actually not a <coughs> toy database, it is used in production, is written in Java, but um, it's lesser known than Elasticsearch, but still DerbyDB is a serious database. But now Facebook's Cassandra, so Facebook Cassandra, is uh, is a NoSQL data store. It uh, it it scales really well. Uh, the writes are very performant. It's written in Java and comes with a little like, like Cassandra because it comes with JMX uh, metrics. So it is really nice to um, or it is really easy to 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 get uh, the monitoring data from Cassandra. And Apache Spark, uh, the whole system is written in Java. Then uh, large parts of Oracle Cloud are written in Java. Um, lots of Google projects are s still Java, and um, and um, yeah, and, and actually, it's really hard uh, to to find um, scalable databases which are uh, a modern, fresh database which is not written in Java. And um, Go, for instance, is very good for writing command line interfaces, for instance. And C C plus plus are are really l good low level languages, but I wouldn't, I think. I don't think that the resource management of C++ is is, is better than Java. Actually, at the beginning, uh, Java uh, Java gained uh, momentum because the uh, the the C++ had uh, uh, huge problems with not garbage collection but resource management. Um, so um, so we had Apache Spark, we had Cassandra, uh, we had. Uh, um, how it's called, MapDB, one of the fastest uh, key value store database. And Java comes with um, with um, a very nice NIO support. So um, I don't think, I don't, I don't see any, any problems with Java. Having said that, if I would write a system tool which runs just on Linux, I would probably uh, take a look at Go Swift, for instance, or, or C, or even Assembler. So uh, just go for it if you if you have the resources. But I would say uh, Java runs, you know, the server side world. I think there's no argue that Java is scalable, and 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 uh, the whole Twitter works on Java. I mean, they had problems with scalability with Ruby. They switched to Java to JVM, and it works really well. Okay, and Scala or Java? I personally would uh, take Java. Keep it simple. And Java eight and Java nine are good enough. And uh, if you have, and if you would like to use Scala, just go for it. But I would ask you, what's you know why you cannot use Java? Which of Java pro pro uh, platform is good for this type of project, uh, like blockchain? So, for instance, if you have in Java, there is a uh, called uh, I think JGit, and JGit implements the uh, 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 Git client for Java. And um, if you have a Git, you have a Merkle tree, and this is shown. Shown. <laughs> this is already. Uh, are parts of the blockchain and encryption is fine with Java so I don't think that actually language matters a lot I like Java uh, Java is the programming language number one still uh, followed, followed by C and JavaScript so I don't see uh, any reasons to switch away from Java 
and uh, all reasons I saw in 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 projects is the developers got bored and would like to try something else. But uh, as I already said, just uh, think about this like your butcher uh, gets bored and don't like to use knives anymore and uses chainsaws just for fun. This is what I observe in my clients. Oh, you know, Java is boring. We need something else. And uh, yeah, then do it. But uh, don't ask me, you know, about the requirements. Uh, you would like just to do something uh, just for fun. So, and, and I do just for fun things in Malaysia. And I try to 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 build the most the most possible boring software on earth for my clients. Why? Because the more boring the software is, the the, the more stable it is, and the more programmers you will find which will able to maintain your stuff. And the more esoteric your language and platform is, the more uh, specific or sp yeah special consult consultants or consultants with special knowledge uh, uh, you will need to you know to solve the problems so and the next question is somehow related to that is what is the ideal use case for uh, reactive extensions and uh, re um, so ideal use case is have, having something like um, stock market for instance on a stock market um, you get a stream of uh, of stocks and you would like immediately react to it and and in the reactive extensions you will get a, like event source and you have like a stream java stream and react to things and this would be the ideal solution um most of the projects are simple CRUD operations absolutely this is also in my world you know my projects are rather simple it's not like i'm building you know stock markets netflix or or twitters um this is where, where they use or facebook's or chats or uh slacks this is where you would need this stuff and if you have you know um a view data sources just go with uh, as you probably saw my java 7 projects are or java 8 projects are like three classes jaxora is boundary and entity and i cannot imagine having something simpler and more understandable understandable than this and a reactive extension i would choose if you have something with streaming objects over the wire uh devices which stream data to you and you would like to react immediately to this and this is where reactive extensions could be interesting Having that said, if you look at your code and your code is simple and understandable, I don't think if you will rewrite to uh, reactive extensions to reactive Java, it is going to be more simple and more understand understandable. And if your code is mess first, there's even even if your code is mess right now uh, or looks messy right now, you will sh have to simplify it first to understand what's going on and then migrate it to reactive extensions. And the question is, you know. Uh, is it worth? And um, usually, if you look at your code and you and you understand that reactive extension is something like persistent uh, observable pattern, so like observer which watches the changes of a of a store, and you can re uh, and, uh, to a store or or event source, and you can subscribe with filter map and do all the stuff and and react to the changes. And if you if you have such a event source, um, then you will immediately see the added value of reactive extensions if you don't have such a such a store then forget about reactive extensions and go with the traditional way and write simple code now S scott hamilton side asked me i'm starting java 7 projects that will need to process and this is a fresh question nine nine uh, hours ago i saw it um uh, recently i'm starting a java 7 project that will need to process messages from a gms provider JMS server, the app needs to be able to determine the message type, then completely parse, validate, and persist its message message before displaying certain attributes to a HTML frontend. There are over 100 message types, which means this, they cannot be a JMS message types. I assume you have something like text message, which is JMS message, and the type is part of the, I would say, JMS header. So, so you, so you uh, pick the uh, type and decide what you can do with the type. Um, representing various sensor data and somewhat complex business rules on how to handle chunks of missing of or conflicting data. So you get, depending on the type, you have to load different complex rules or dif different rules how to handle chunks of missing conflict data. Yeah. So you you so what I understood is you have a type depending validation, and uh, the result of the validation has to be displayed in HTML5 frontend. 
The messages, the messages will usually come in a rate of view per second. So you have a view transactions per second, let's say 10 transactions per second. So sometimes there will be a burst of high volume. Can you please go over any architectural design consideration or recommendation for building something like this? Um, also any special consideration on how to test performance of microservices, either individually or app as a whole. So uh, for the performance, what I use is JMH, Java Micro Harness, is part of OpenJDK. Take a look at the uh, microservice course. I use that there. So um, Java EE, how it's called? Java EE Microservices. Uh, uh, go to ehex.io and you will find ehex.io and you will find a course. And um, I use JMH and show how to use that. So um, this is one of my favorites. Why? Because you implement the uh, benchmarks in in a let's say uh, in a Java class and use the JMH annotations and they get executed somewhere and you get uh, text output and um, uh, special consideration on how to test performance of microservices. Yeah, this will be covered. And now about the design. So what you got is a JMS queue, and what you will what I would do is to have one uh, component called uh, dispatcher type detector or something like this it would take a look at the message and then so you have 100 messages so what what could be it it could ev um, either forward the message to another queue or uh, just in place load a particular validation logic so there are view transactions per second and what i understood the uh, message is a text message so what you could actually do is depending you will you could have something like a hash map with message type in validation and the validator would be let's say a functional interface with uh, input is text message and output is validation errors like a list or use even bin validation could also work and uh, th such a functional interface could be implemented by a java class or even javascript so you can dynamically load the rules so the question is whether i think you s I think I'm just reading, I think there there is a sense, yeah, various sensor data. So what it means is um, you get, uh, you could even get, I guess, new sensors, which would, which were not available before. So then you would be flexible. So what it means is you would have a simple database with message type and in the validation would be a Nashorn script or uh, later GraalVM script. It doesn't matter, JavaScript for validation logic and you can down you can for each message type go to the table load the script and this will be very like almost serverless architecture load you know the function from the database instantiate it pre-compile it and, and keep it and uh, performance is usually fine uh, because it is going to be optimized by the hotspot vm and the cool story is if the performance is not good enough um, you could actually start multiple such dispatchers because they can consume the messages uh, transactionally so um, you can scale as you like and then the problem is the the uh, the certain attributes will be displayed in html5 front end so i guess you will have to aggregate the results somewhere again so what you could have is this the multiple validators could output the uh, the results in a central queue of course the problem is then the uh, the uh, order of the messages could get lost which uh, you should i, I think be able to live with that because if everything is displayed in a in an in a dashboard uh, it shouldn't matter in which order it is displayed so this would be the first idea uh i got it a few minutes ago what i would do and uh we did something at, it was a 15 years ago for a, for a power grid uh, with uh, the first versions of jbos and it also worked well okay so now now we covered all the questions from from the gist and I would like to take a look. Oh, Monsieur Bucker, uh, some Bucker, Tucker, from uh, Utah or California right now says hello. So hello, and so um, Omar Alvarez asked me, "Are you already in production with Java 8?" Yes. If so, which application server is more appropriate? Open Liberty, perfect. Pyara 5, go for it. And uh, and also uh, Whitefly 13, you can use absolutely. So uh, use whatever you like so far. And uh, yeah, and I use right now Open Liberty and uh, Pyra 5. Whitefly 13 support is experimental, so you have to set up a switch. Okay, this was a question from Twitter. 
now back to my questions from my blog. How do you approach authentication and session handling for this type of application? This type of application, this is from my blog, this is from here, is this? Uh, this is where frontend and backend are split into se uh, separate projects and uh, and this is based on a session from DevOx PL, Linear Web Ask with Skinny uh, Mini Services and this is feedback to this video. So, and if uh, both are split, what's, what's the approach? And the approach is JSON Web Token and right now I'm exactly in such projects and we use uh, Keycloak as SSO and the front-end authenticates against Keycloak. The uh, JSON Web Token is passed to a microprofile server. The microprofile uh, creates from the JSON Web Token roles and then everything looks like regular Java 7 application. So this is what I do right now. So uh, are you using anything from Java Security or microprofile JSON Web Token? Not Java Security SL, uh, Java 8 Security yet. Um, this is Java 8 server, Glassfish 5 actually. And we use with Glass because Glassfish 5, uh, Glassfish 5, Payara 5 ships with Microprofile JWT. We use that and we consider properly used uh, Java 8 security as well, but uh, this works well enough. And we use um, Keycloak um, for, I think, for one something uh, running in a central Docker container. How do you package and deploy the front end? Uh, Currently, it's a war. So we have two wars. We have front-end and back-end wars. There's exactly two wars on Payara. But this is something to do with my client. And on my my blog, the front-end is Apache and back-end is uh, Tommy, Whitefly, or Payara. So it depends what we are doing. I think if you register to my workshop, it is Whitefly. Blog runs on Tommy. And Payara are the statistics here. So this is this is my blog. And on my new server, I will use Nginx for the front end and back end is a Java e servant server. And um, yeah, Open Liberty would be fine, but back then there was no Open Liberty. Can you please elaborate on an explanation on inject and um, at EJB? So let's see what's, oh, this is the feedback to, to, to the air hacks the last air hacks and um, at inject and EJB. And uh, what I remember is in the comment, uh, there was the question about singletons. So um, you can inject EJB as at inject or at EJB. It does not matter a lot. Um, the main question is at EJB or the, 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 the main statement is at EJB annotation is more powerful because it also supports JNDI and all the stuff. And with at inject, you can inject CDI or EJBs. With at EJB, you can only inject EJBs because the annotation is older. But um, according to the spec, EJBs are also CDI managed beans. So um, what I do, I just use at inject and it works perfectly. I would like to know how can I control transactions through microservices? And the, uh, the answer is very simple. You cannot do this. So let's go here. Um, so we have uh, two microservices and there is no coordination between microservices. So, and, and therefore, what I always say is uh, you can only create nice microservices if you know, you know the business logic really well and you should avoid two-phase commit and distributed transactions always. So, um, so what, you, what you should do instead of um, relying on transactions you should uh, have compensating transactions. So we have two microservices. The classic is one is hotel booking, the other one is flight booking. So if the hotel booking fails and you already booked the flight, you should be able to uh, you should be able to cancel <coughs> the flight afterwards. And this is actually the the, the common scenario scenario right, right now. If you buy something, let's say at Amazon, you can uh, in the next I don't know half an hour even edit your order, change the credit card, and even uh, cancel the order. And if you're able to do this, transactions are become less important because you can afterwards change the to, 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 uh, uh, until uh, you know the timeout. You can change you know the state of your transaction afterwards. So, is there any mechanism to feed the scheduled data programmatically? So let's see here, and this is a schedule, and of course there is because I have also and um been uh, how to call it configurable timer and simplest possible timer and there's another blog post so you can you can you can create uh, timers on the fly 
and also there was I think it's called and I'm being managed schedule schedule service something like this yes and there is also another possibility this is implemented with uh, injected managed scheduled executor service and with that you can also create timers on the fly and these timers are completely independent from EGB timers. So you have two possibilities, this timer uh, and the EGB uh, programmatic timer. So you have two possibilities. So as always, everything is possible in Java E. So where I was, I was here, come back here. How can it conveniently map more complex objects like business objects containing other objects with the use of your null library approach? So what he means null library approach, uh, this is the uh, JSON is the new data transfer object. And what I do is I have a method to JSON and this object maps automatically to a JSON object. So this happens uh, so automatically, you have to write that. And I do it always. And if the object is more complex, there's more code. But keep in mind, if you wouldn't have that, you would probably use, you know, uh, I don't know, uh, data transfer object and copy the, the data by, inv by invoking get and setters. And uh, what you can also do in Java 8, you can use JSONB. And if JSONB, you can even implement your own strategies and, and serialize the objects in a custom way. So you have JSONB and you can use this. And, and if the object is more complex, so you have to write more code, but, um, because you are inside the object, it's actually fairly easy. So what I do, I write the f uh, right sign first. I say right side first. This dot something, and and then this name, and then I think about you know what should be the name, so you get even mapping for free. So I actually like this approach. Um, yeah, and if you have uh, huge objects and never had such a project, uh, supporting my project, uh, you could even generate that. Because if you think about this, uh, this code is very similar to uh, to string template in most IDEs. So if you manipulate it to string template in your IDE, it should be also able to generate that, or at, at least scaffold that, so you can just adjust that. Okay, so what's the state here? So no questions in Twitter, no questions in the chat. Uh, I would just refresh the page. Not that I got, you know. No, that was the last question. So I would say thank you for watching and see you in September. And um, some of you in December with uh, Christmas market, glowing wine and air hacks at Munich airport. And uh, yeah, enjoy the summer. Bye.